Usually we put a banana peel up, but. Good evening, and welcome to the third evening of this uh, URI Honors Colloquium series on inequality in the American dream. My name is Rick McIntyre, and I'm the chair of the economics department here at URI, and once upon a time, um, I was director of the honors program. So I, I think I remember how to do this. Um, this is going to be like one of those YouTube videos. You're going to get the commercial first. So tomorrow night at 6 o'clock in uh, Duty Auditorium, Swan Hall, right around the corner here, um, we're going to have a conversation. Uh, Umberto Miranda from the Institute of Philosophy in uh, Havana, Cuba, and myself are going to talk about inequality and the Cuban dream. So if you're interested in that, uh, come tomorrow night, 6 o'clock, uh, Agnes Duty Hall, Agnes Duty Auditorium, Swan Hall. Um, I was part of the group that wrote the proposal for this colloquium, and I'm very happy to see it now realized by the four coordinators and Lynn Derbyshire's team in honors. And uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be asked to introduce uh, one of the really finest social and political historians uh, currently working in the United States, that's Jefferson Cowie. Um, during the 1930s and 40s, there was a dramatic decline in inequality in the United States. Because on the one hand, at the bottom, unions, social security, the minimum wage, pulled the bottom up. And at the top, there was a dramatic decrease in the value of assets during the Great Crash, and the very high tax rates that were imposed to fund World War II meant that upper-income people saw their incomes come down a bit. And the United States in the 1940s resembled a fairly egalitarian society. Um, and this was maintained for three decades into the 1970s, when it began to fray a little bit and then completely unravel in the 18, 1980s and 90s to the point where income inequality now is at levels that it was before the Great Depression. Many, many books have been written about this. Our students, I think, can't believe how many books have been written about this. Um, and a lot of these books um, end with a call for something like a new New Deal. We need a new New Deal. Um, that is not what Jeff Cowie says in his book, The Great Exception. Um, his argument, more subtle and sophisticated than I can give you in this introduction, is that the New Deal was the product of a really unusual conjuncture of forces in American history. Its foundations were fragile, um, and we will not see its like again. I'm not sure I agree with that. But we won't go into that now, will we? I do know that his argument is worth listening to, I'm sure he is right that any new egalitarian movement will have to work outside the bounds of existing labor law through local living wage movements, worker centers, in the immigrant enclaves, in alliance with spiritual leaders, across racial divides, to create any kind of collective movement against our new gilded age. Many of these possibilities will be discussed in upcoming weeks here in this colloquium. He is also right, I'm sure, that we must place at the center of our political economy now a discussion of something amazing, the restoration of the nearly uncontestable power of the fictitious yet legally recognized individual called the corporation. Jefferson Cowie recently joined the faculty at Vanderbilt University where he moved after teaching at Cornell University for 18 years. At Vanderbilt, he holds the James G. Stallman Chair in American History. You seem much too young to have that fancy of a title. Um, his work focuses on how class, inequality, and labor shape American politics and culture. His first book, Capital Moves, RCA's 70-Year Quest for Cheap Labor, published in 1999, shows how many of the issues that we talk about now, 
in terms of globalization have historical roots deep in the 20th century. Staying Alive, the 1970s and the Last Days of the Working Class, his next book, in addition to having a great title, won the Francis Parkman Prize for the best book in American history from the Society of American Historians. This year, he published The Great Exception, The New Deal, and The Limits of American Politics. And I'm really excited to be able to welcome to our stage tonight Jefferson Cowell. Good evening. Thanks for having me here. And uh, many thanks to my hosts, uh, for Professor Loomis for showing me around, and to the Honors Colloquium for uh, selecting me to be part of this fantastic series, which I think is really, uh, couldn't be more timely, couldn't be more relevant to what's going on today. And so what I wanted, like to do as the title uh, suggests is uh, think a little bit about uh, the politics of inequality now, uh, juxtaposed with uh, the politics of inequality in the past and what it took to tame the politics of inequality in America and see if I can make a more convincing case than I did um, to some skeptics of my arguments. <laughs> Donald Trump, last year. Five, ten years from now, different party. You're going to have a workers' party, a party of people that haven't had a real wage increase in 18 years that are angry. A workers' party. When's the last time anybody said anything about a workers' party, right? Um, even from a figure like Trump, there's something sort of refreshing knocking around in that term, I think. Uh, inside that corpulent sort of bluster is the attempt to fill a, a decades-old void in our civic culture. And I think that void in our culture is where we used to talk about the issues of working people. And I think the rise of Donald Trump, in some ways, is more symptom of this than he is actually cause, or even perhaps even the problem. Uh, much of blue-collar America, especially white blue-collar America, uh, and I'm, uh, uh, which I think has going to be what I'll talk about a lot today, um, has been silently screaming in the political darkness for a number of decades. And I think they're just now beginning to find an echo in their concerns through the Trump campaign. In the 1970s, we saw a stunning U-turn of many of the gains of this demographic as good jobs began to wither, inequality began to rise, wages began to stagnate, uh, wealth accumulated at the top, uh, and politics turned from sort of a lunch bucket liberalism uh, to focusing on the pressing needs of underrepresented and excluded social groups. Very important political work, I might add. Um, and today, while many urban centers uh, of innovation are exploding with vitality, those left in the abandoned lands of the former industrial South and Midwest seem to be finding solace in a haze of opiates, meth, and nationalist rage. They have fallen from privilege to poverty, and it was a long way to fall. As a sociologist, Jennifer Silver has summarized the experience of white working class people coming of age in this e economy. Quote, economic insecurity seeps into their homes where experiences of family dissolution through divorce and premature parental death, illness and work-related disabilities, domestic violence, and constant financial stress leave them uncertain and anxious. That result in anxiety means that people are coming of age in a toxic stew of failed institutions and failed hope. At its core, continues Silva, this emerging working class adult self is characterized by low expectations of work, wariness towards romantic commitment, widespread distrust of social institutions, profound isolation from others, and an overriding focus on emotions and psychic health. I think what's interesting today, given all of the bad news, I think, that we've received in police shootings and, and, and immigrant bashing and things like this that have emerged uh, recently is that almost all groups in America are optimistic about the future, except for blue-collar whites. Hispanics are almost a third more likely to imagine a better f future than poor whites. African Americans, facing what I regard as inhumane rates of incarceration and police violence, are still three times more optimistic than working-class whites. 
and that's even controlling for economic status. Uh, the Washington Post called the outlooks of blue-collar whites shockingly dismal. Um, and recent reports um, suggest that they're not solely in despair, but in fact dropping out of the job market, disappearing from civic life, and actually dying. Mortality rates, which have historically increased across the board, have actually decreased for white male workers. And we don't know why. We don't know why. But they're dying younger. The Nobel Prize winning research team had discovered the trend, can't account for the change, but they have speculated that it is the product of a demographic that, quote, is susceptible to despair, as the economic, occupational, and political world has abandoned them. They have, he postulates, or they postulate, quote, lost the narrative of their lives. I think that's a beautiful, horrible way of thinking about this, a group that has lost the narrative of their lives. Um, and of course, Trump says the system's rigged, right? The system's rigged. And actually, what we know is, yes, he's actually empirically correct. The system is, is rigged. Uh, Martin Gillens and Benjamin Page's now famous uh, research from Princeton shows that economic elites and organized business interests have almost sole control over American politics. Examining just under 1,800 policy initiatives, it was only when the policy preferences that were endorsed by the most affluent, the top, uh, the 90th percentile and above, uh, that policies actually became law. Bill Gillens and Page, I think, have in essence shown that the United States is in fact an oligarchy, not in metaphor, but in reality. And this isn't brand new. This isn't an issue for our campaign season. Compare Trump's in-your-face sort of unrestrained class id with candidate Barack Obama's much more fatalistic reflections in 2008. As Obama mused, if you wander through the small towns in the heartland where the jobs have been gone now for 25 years and nothing's replaced them, it comes cl becomes clear that workers fell through the Clinton administration and the Bush administration and each successive administration has said that somehow these communities are going to regenerate, and they have not. Yet then he got in trouble for stating the obvious. And it's not surprising that they get bitter, that they cling to guns or religion or, anti or antipathy toward people who aren't like them, or anti-immigrant sentiment or anti-trade sentiment as a way to explain their frustrations. Unfortunately, despite such awareness, not that much changed under the Obama administration. Some things did. So I want to look at a, a group that is currently facing uh, what Arlie Hochschild in her new book, Strangers in Our, Their Land, Strangers in Their Own Land, excuse me, calls the triple marginalization, flat and falling wages. A rapid demographic change in which they're beginning to be called the white minority. So it's actually plurality is the term, but I think we're paranoid enough to call it minority. And a liberal culture that uh, tends to, or they feel, tends to mock their patriotism and their religious faith. So with that framework in mind, let me jump into what's going on. This is uh, the share of total household wealth that's accrued to various uh, groups from the, uh, this is a, uh, from the Economic Policy Institute, uh, sit for between the 80s and 2010. And if you were at the bottom fifth over here, you lost money, um, lost wealth, second fifth you lost wealth, middle fifth you lost wealth, fourth fifth you're beginning to see some accumulation, and then once you get up in the uh, higher um, deciles in the top 1%, you're beginning to see some growth. So you, so you see that, that s people are getting sharper elbows at the wealth table. As I, my, my students often ask, well, who cares? Nobody's starving. This isn't, there's nothing horrible about this. It's just inequality, and in a, even when they recognize inequality is growing. Well, if you haven't seen, if the students who are studying inequality haven't seen this graph yet, I'm sure they will. This is um, by Wilkinson, Wilkinson and Pickett. Uh, not to be confused with Wilson Pickett, um, in which they create an index of bad things over here. Life expectancy, math, liter math and literacy, infant mortality, homicides, imprisonment, teenage births, trust, obesity, mental illness, social mobility. And so that 
um, index goes from better to worse in these social indicators, and then they track it by income, low inequality to high inequality. And so down here you have, you know, Finland and Sweden and people like that who have low inequality and low social outcomes. There's the United States up there, almost off the charts in both. Still, why should you care? We're affluent, we're privileged, we're at the University of Rhode Island, we're all good. Well, in fact, your life expectancy as an affluent person is shorter in, an in a more unequal country. We all have an interest in decreasing inequality. Now, what's going on? As we heard, I refer to something in the post-war era as the great exception, and I want to try and get at what I'm talking about with this. Because there was a time when inequality actually went down instead of up. And it was this relatively rare moment in the post-war period. This is a uh, graph of the share of annual income earned by the top 1%. And as you can see, um, they are uh, sort of bopping along here at a, at, at a fairly high percentage of the uh, uh, um, economy. It goes down radically in the 30s, stays down fairly low, and then shoots back up. So the rich, as, 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 as we heard, um, because of the uh, um, compression during the war, because of the mobilization of workers, all these things that I'm going to talk about in a minute. But what strikes me is that people tend to look at this and this, but we don't, can't quite account for why we have this trough. And I think if we look at a lot of measures of the post-war era, we see either a trough or a hump. Um, and I've, I put these lines on the graph between 1936 and 1978 just for, sort of for a reference point. Here's union density. Unions being one of the great redistributive mechanisms uh, of any economy. And it's, it's basically you know, a mountain that goes up and goes down from 1936 to 1978. This extraordinary, exceptional period in American history. Um, this is uh, uh, party animosity, party polarization. How much the Republicans hate the Democrats, how much the Democrats hate the Republicans. It won't get along. Um, it's uh, party animosity is pretty high here, goes down, and we have, again, this trough where this era of good feelings down here where people are getting together, and then they shoot back up and begin to dislike each other again. The political scientists who created this metric regarded 1.0 as perfect animosity. We are currently at 1.1. <laughs> I'm going to make more of this in a minute. This is House polarization, how, uh, animosity within uh, the House of Representatives uh, on the blue. And the red superimposed over that is the percentage of foreign born in the country. Put that away for a minute. Even the frequency of banking crises from 1800 all the way to the present day shows a noted blank spot during this period. What's going on? So there's a, there's a great deal of debate about this. What, you know, what happened at this time? What, you know, what happened during the New Deal? Was the, you know, how do we frame this question? And uh, as Richard Kirkendall, one of the noted historians, says, was the New Deal a radical innovation or a continuation of earlier themes? Was it a revolution or part of a long-term evolutionary development? Was it a watershed or a deepening and widening of a stream that had sources in the early period? Should we think about continuity, difference, rupture? What, what's the question? Well, liberals tend to see this as a, the liberal historians tend to see this as a sort of a, a semi-revolutionary triumph that is connected to a long history, a linear history of struggle for reform. Um, conservatives tend to see this in the, in the historiography as, as a, a, a muddled state response, a ham-fisted response to a crisis that made it worse um, once the state got involved, the, the, de the depression that is. New left historians coming out of the 1960s and 1970s uh, tend to see it more as a, as a conservative response, doing the least uh, that needed to be done to prop up a capitalist system 
and that one that checked a more dynamic um, uh, push for social change from below. I'm going to challenge all of this. And here's how I'm going to do it. In contrast to all of these approaches, I'm going to say that the New Deal, this time that many refer to as a model for change for our own time, was a positive, so it's not uh, unlike the conservative school, uh, I think it's very positive, but unstable experiment that proved to be divergent from some of the dominant trends of American pol life, political life. It was a triumph of redistributive policy, not the failure that the new left would have it, uh, it was hardly an unnecessary intervention, in the, in, as the conservative right would have it, uh, since I think it fostered a model for our own time. But it was clearly not a permanent revolution in the way we thought of ourselves as, the, as a country. I, my argument is that this, we can understand this as a great exception, a sustained deviation, an extended detour from some of the main contours of American political practice, economic structure, and cultural outlook. And I'm going to look at, very, very quickly, because you don't want to be here all night, um, these uh, five, one, two, six variables on the right, race, immigration, individualism, religion and culture wars, class and labor, and the state. Very quickly. And I'm going to give you a very crude periodization in which I'll give you the pre-New Deal period, the New Deal order, which will be roughly the 30s to the 70s, and then the post-New Deal period from 19, roughly 1978 onward. And I, I don't get hung up on the years because different things are happening at different times, but roughly 30s to the 70s. And I'm going to argue that each of these things worked in a different way that allowed American politics to be focused on economic issues rather than a, what is more traditional in American politics, which is ethnic, religious, cultural, racial conflict that the post-New Deal era that we are in now actually looks a lot like the Gilded Age in terms of how politics works. <clears throat> so I'm going to break each one of those down as we um, go along. Begin with the state. Um, anybody who knows uh, the history of the Gilded Age, of course, it's the era of the robber barons. Uh, there are some uh, uh, significant reforms during the Progressive Era from 1901 to 1917, largely in the realm of regulation, not redistribution, except for maybe the, the war and uh, the beginnings of, of, of taxation. But by and large, the business, as Calvin Coolidge says, the business of America is business. Um, and that's what, we, what, what emerges um, at this, um, uh, or that's what begins to fall apart with the coming of the Great Depression. The New Deal order, we, we, um, the state for the first time really reorients itself away from just doing the bidding of business and actually takes an active interest in the interest of working people. Uh, and then of course this flips back uh, I invoke Calvin Coolidge, and Ronald Reagan's uh, favorite president was Calvin Coolidge, um, and the state reorients itself toward being uh, an agent for business. Uh, and I, I will develop these a little bit more. But I also want to point out, well, I should point out, first of all, FDR actually couldn't stand, but uh, had he been able to stand, I'm sure he would have liked to shake some stockbrokers. Um, that even we tend to look at the function of the state in such a way that, um, oh, you know, the Great Depression happened and all of this regulation and redistribution happened. Well, I actually think it's actually what I call a political gauntlet, a very narrow opening through which a great deal of change passed. It was a rare moment. It, it's not, it was not axiomatic that all this would happen. It was pretty tenuous. First of all, Roosevelt's elected three years into the Great Depression. So a lot of bad stuff had happened. Very different compared with Obama in 2008, where he comes in right at the beginning of the, of the mess. So Congress is ready to turn over 
the, the, the legisla legislative agenda to the president. Then he, he launches into a long uh, set of reforms that we historians call the First New Deal. They didn't work. They were more or less, except for a few things, a flop. The National Industrial Re uh, Recovery Act being probably the most, most important. Then the second New Deal, where we get the core things we tend to think of, Social Security, the National Labor Relations Act, and the Fair Labor Standards Act. So Social Security, you all know that. Uh, Fair Labor Standards Act provided for minimum wage, 40-hour work week, no child labor. And the National Labor Relations Act, which gave unions the right to exist for the first time in American history, um, was a, this really tiny window, 35 through 38, and then whoosh, it, sh it slammed shut. So it's really a three-year moment. And then Roosevelt's back on the ropes. The conservative movement uh, uh, is attacking him, and he actually uh, turns his back on reform and begins to um, uh, 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 curl, uh, curtail the New Deal. He, he's able to get a lot of this through the Supreme Court, which had, up to that time had stopped almost all, for all reform efforts on the national uh, level. Um, and, but he's able to do this through the famous uh, uh, Supreme Court packing scheme and, and the political energy that's rising up from below. And then, but then, boom, counterattack happens. And then, right when the New Deal's on the ropes, it may not survive. And the industrial union movement that is launched in 1935, 36, 37, it also looks like it may not survive this counterattack. World War II happens, what some people call the Third New Deal. And it's really mobilization around war that institutionalizes a lot of these practices. So what we end up with is a package of goods, even in the heat of the 1930s, that are very, very tenuous. So it's not enough to sit around and go, well, when the economy collapses, we'll get all this stuff back. Um, I don't think that's the way it's going to work. And then Alan Brinkley called uh, this the end of reform. <coughs> So, so that was argument one, that the, po that, the, that the state reorientation toward working people's interests was short and tenuous. Uh, one historian called the labor movement that emerged from this time period the fragile juggernaut. And I think that's a really good metaphor for understanding the entire New Deal. It's a fragile juggernaut, very powerful, but very frail. Now, why didn't we just descend into all sorts of, you know, uh, ethnic racial chaos when this happened? Well, for one reason, in the pre-New Deal peri period, immigration is very large in America and very racialized. But it is cut off with World War I and then in 1924 with the immigration, quote unquote, reforms that highly racialized immigration and basically cut it off. So when the Depression hit, except for, mo except for Mexicans who were uh, forced uh, into a forced repatriation, uh, there really aren't that many immigrants in the United States, and there aren't until 1965 when we open back up immigration. So this is what this this period of the great exception, as I call it, is also a period in which there are, are no immigrants to fight with or to fight about. This allows an orientation towards economic questions. This gives you a sense of the way ethnic and immigrant fragmentation work. This is the steel strike in 1919 after World War I, and you see Uncle Sam calling back to work uh, all the workers in a host of languages. And if, if you could get the native-born English-speaking workers to go back to work, you could basically break a strike. And they were, it was easy to divide and conquer. And you know, it was a, it was a stew. Of, of, of ethnic and racial antagonisms in the Gilded Age. St skilled native stock Protestant workers tended to be Republican and often carried cards in the craft unions of the old American Federation of Labor. Old Irish and German Catholics might also be in the skilled trades, but tended to be in the Democratic Party. New immigrants from the Southern and Eastern Europe were often unskilled workers and unorganized workers, um, but also tended to be in different political parties than the skilled workers. Um, black workers in the north tended to be Republican, which placed them at odds with those northern workers who were closest to them economically. And of course, they experienced almost complete system system systemic exclusion 
uh, in, in the South. There was all, really only one ethnic thing that united workers in the Gilded Age and into the early 20th century, and that is they hated the Chinese. Um, that uh, Chinese exclusion was the one unifying principle of, of, of the sort of ethno-antagonistic uh, uh, mess. And what this meant was that, oh, right, so I, I, I showed you this, this already, that, that Antagon uh, uh, party polarization tracks the foreign-born quite closely. And so reform politics in America under, for, Im for immigration was by and large um, oriented towards moral questions, especially in the progressive era, the first two decades of the 20th century. It was about uplifting immigrants and making them better citizens and better white people. Um, that goes away. That moral reform impulse goes away, and the reform impulse of the New Deal era allows people to focus on economic questions. They're not distracted by these other issues. It is similar with the culture wars. It connects or, and wars over religion. Uh, this, this, the, these dovetail quite neatly, um, but really if we go back to the 19th century, we see a culture wars politics much like we have in our own time. Um, the Republicans accuse the Democrats of being for Rome, Rome, uh, Ro <laughs> rum, Romanism, and rebellion. That is the party of drinking, Catholicism, and Southern rebellion, right? Um, and the Republican Party at the time was trying to bolster up the WASP establishment. Well, this goes away, really, this, uh, uh, to a great deal because of, A, the Scopes trial, the Scopes monkey trial in the 1920s, really sort of humiliated, in some ways, the evangelical right, um, and then as, uh, um, as the economic crisis became uh, so prevalent, prevalent, even uh, the most uh, fervent evangelical Christians signed on to the New Deal, and the, and the South signed on to the New Deal. As... Um, Walter Lippmann, the famous journalist, said the best brains and the good sense of the modern community uh, in uh, Bible thumping is no longer resonates with the best brains and the good sense of the modern community. Well, Baptist leaders like um, Oliver Van Osdell instructed his colleagues to reject the public sphere altogether, modeling the struggles of, quote, the rejected son of God in the days of declension and compromise. So these outward expressions of religion fall away um, into what Roosevelt called uh, the covenant with ourselves. Uh, and, and Roosevelt, so here's the Scopes trial uh, out here on the left, and here is a, uh, some uh, what, are, what were called defense oakies uh, in the center, and, and what you see over the mantle there is Roosevelt himself, who played a very important role as almost a spiritual father of the nation at the time. Martha Gellhorn, who was sent out to canvas the land uh, to see how Roosevelt was doing, reported back, the feeling of these people for the president is one of the most remarkable phenomenon I have ever seen. He is at once God and their intimate friend. He knew them all by name, knows their little town and mill, their little lives and problems, and though everything fails, he is there and will not let them down. And the post-war period, it wasn't just a product of the Depression. Religious historians call this the era of religious truce, the, 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 the period of an interfaith amnity in which all faiths agree to uh, get along together. Even though it's a time of very high religiosity, this is when we put uh, under God and the Pledge of Allegiance and all this sort of thing, but it's very low in interfaith hostilities over the meaning of the words of God. Until the 1970s, when cultural issues like busing, abortion, uh, homosexuality, pornography, birth control, um, uh, really begin to um, rattle the political sphere. Here we have, you may, some of you may remember uh, Anita here, who was uh, one of the great um, ralliers against um, homosexuality in the 1970s. Um, Okay, so that was argument three, culture wars. Argument four is a little more complicated. 
Obviously, race is alive and well today uh, in the headlines almost every day. One of the great questions of the New Deal is the racial dimensions of, of the New Deal. In the pre-New Deal order, order, it's obvious to understand it was all about the politics of exclusion, excluding African Americans. Today, it's a very, ten, very difficult debate over inclusion of African Americans. What happens in between is much more complicated. And if we begin with the passage of the New Deal itself, we learn that the, the New Deal actually excluded African Americans. So, you know, one of the great questions of politics is, for instance, the Great Society gets tagged as being uh, highly racialized. Well, to, in order to win the politics of the Solid South, that had tremendous political power in the Democratic Party, the New Deal had to exclude agricultural workers and domestic workers. That meant most of the African Americans in the South. That allowed, that exclusion allowed for the political passage of the New Deal. Yet at the same time, it's not just exclusion because Roosevelt, uh, Franklin, and Eleanor are reaching out with the other hand to African Americans, especially in the North. They're, they're going into uh, labor unions. Uh, they're going into politics. Roosevelt has a black, what he calls the black cabinet. Um, and, and so you have this very tenuous trick where the Democratic Party is, as one person says, carrying water on both shoulders in terms of the race question, right? Uh, and, and so it's this, this, this sort of mixed moment that doesn't last long. And once race really explodes within the Democratic Party in the 1960s, it can't handle it, and it falls apart. Harold Ickes, one of the great New Dealers, explained that he wanted to change Jim Crow segregation, but not if it meant, quote, wasting my strength against a particular stone wall of segregation. In other words, it was felt that this was immovable. Um, and because of civil rights was not part of the New Deal state making, argues the political scientist Paul Freimer, many of its fundamental features would turn out to be not so fundamental, that it was essentially a white New Deal. Individualism. Individualism is one of the most difficult to grasp variables in American politics. But I argue it's very strong. So for the pre-New Deal, it's very strong. Some even would say social Darwinist. Uh, Herbert Hoover, who ran for, who was president when the crash happened, had just made a famous speech about quoting, uh, creating the term rugged individualism right before the entire thing falls apart. But in the 1930s, there's a very unique switch on individualism. It's not complete, but you can see it in movies. You know, you've seen a Frank Capra movie or something like that where people are always coming together to save things. And that happens in the 1930s, and that individualism is checked. Uh, it's, there's a sense that we got into this crisis together, we'll get out of it together. In the post-New Deal period, <clears throat> I, I argue that there is a revived individualism. It's a better individualism. It's a more inclusive individualism. It's about women's rights, African American rights, gay rights, Latino rights, uh, the, uh, ability rights, all sorts of things. And this is great. It's a really important transformation. But all those individual rights don't change the collective distribution of the economy. So you have a very strong, almost social Darwinist version of individualism, a Czech version, and then a revived rights consciousness version of individualism, which dom almost completely dominates uh, uh, politics today. The slogans are obvious, the right to choose, right to life, right to bear arms, gay rights, equal rights amendment, prayer in schools, right to work, welfare rights, consumer rights, and even white ethnics claim to individual rights through group identity as a result of this. It becomes what somebody called the near invincible trump card in most debates regarding public policy today, just like it was before. But it was not in the post-war period. But even at the time, people knew that, that individual rights had not been 
overcome in America, that the individualism of America had not been uh, 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 triumphed over. Rexford Tugwell uh, said he learned that there would be no quick change from an individualist to a more collectivized society, that the New Deal um, would compromise measures which, from his standpoint, were essentially superficial, that they were, that, 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 that it, it, it talked about it. And in fact, the term liberalism, the way we use it today, was designed to sort of connect with a, an earlier version of individual rights. Okay, moving rapidly. Um, perhaps the most significant difference in this interregnum period, this, this sustained deviation, this great exception in American history, is the way class and labor functioned. The short version of all of labor history between the dawn of time in the United States and 1935 is state repression. Uh, if you went on strike, you risk getting slapped with an injunction and the troops being called out and your strike being crushed. Um, and here we have Uncle Sam paddling union labor saying he's sick and tired of that. In the 1930s, it becomes what I call legitimate but contained uh, through the Wagner Act, especially which provided the right to organize in 1935 during that short 35 to 38 window we talked about. And of course, here's the poster saying, if I went to a work, if I went to work in a factory, the first thing I do would I do would be to join a union. Franklin Roosevelt, he never said that, but nonetheless, it was it was a it was politically plausible that he did say it, right? Um, and then 1981, uh, spring and summer of 1981, Ronald Reagan uh, fires the professional air traffic controllers, Patco, um, opening up. Uh, another non-union era that we live in today. Not totally non-union, but close. What I call repression within a labor rights regime. So we officially have a uh, right to organize unions, but not actually in reality. And I think any of the organizers in the room would probably um, back me up on that question. Um, I'm gonna flip through that. Okay, so The period in the post-war era, this New Deal order, was as the, my um, senior colleague, labor historian Nelson Lichtenstein put it, a period in which industrial unions, unionism's moment of unrivaled triumph was exceedingly brief but powerful, right? There's this moment where it bursts open and then it serves this function. And it's very real. Some of the students read Jack Metzger's uh, Striking Steel for this colloquium. Um, he says, in the 1950s and onward, we were learning to tolerate less and less repression from anybody or anything. If what we lived in through the 1950s was not liberation, then liberation never happens in real human lives. Right? This is a working class that went from poverty to relative affluence in the course of a generation. But then it collapsed. And we revert back to the sort of Gilded Age model, right. the New Gilded Age. The New Gilded Age, I might add, the Gilded Age being the late 19th century, the New Gilded Age, I might add, in which actually living conditions were getting better for most working people in the United States. Now they're, they're flatlining or decreasing. Um, uh, gilded, a different, another difference, of course, is that this was a, a time of tremendous, the old Gilded Age was a time of tremendous tumult around ideas and politics and what we're gonna do about all this. And now we seem to be in a bit of a velvet cage with regard to these questions. Okay, so what does this mean? Where does this leave us? Where does this sad tale uh, leave us? Not there. First, uh, my first conclusion is that the New Deal order, the post-war era, was an exception to many of the main currents of American history. And that's a problem. Like, that's a, a major political problem. An enormous, I think, political problem for us. We can't just recreate this past recipe. That this is an irony of American history. And I'm not talking for those 
uh, eggheads in the room, I'm not talking about the Reinhold Niebuhr version of the irony of American history, but that the irony that the most successful economic era for the nation's working people came concurrently with the suspension of some of the most defining aspects of American history. Right? This is an era of relative homogeneity in the post-war period. Artificially created, perhaps, by excluding African Americans or excluding immigrants, um, but a time when individualism, religion, race, uh, 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 and immigration are all at bay, right? It's, 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 it's like a, it's a counter story to the main narrative of American history. Yet, it's the time when uh, equality goes down and when partisanship goes down. We tend to agree. There's a kind of a so, uh, political axiom in, uh, uh, of political science uh, that more homogenous countries tend to be more social democratic and we had our sort of social democratic moment when we were more homogenous as a population, even if it was kind of a false homog uh, homogeneity. Um, Richard Hofstadter, the great historian, called it the era of America's social democratic tinge. So that means, if I'm right, and not everybody agrees, as we saw, um, actually, this is a very controversial argument, right? So you should, you should know that. <laughs> Forget everything I said. That the New Deal becomes a problematic metaphor for the future. That here we are in an era of inequality, right? Tremendous inequality. One of the key defining political questions of our time. Yet, if you believe me, the one time that it went away is not a very useful guide to the future. And you'll, but you'll see this, the global new, people want the global new deal, the new new deal, the new and improved deal, the re-new deal, the new deal 2.0, it's, it's all over the place. Um, uh, but then it becomes this sort of shock uh, of reality that the new Gilded Age seems to have a lot more traction in American political culture than did the hope of a new deal. The return of plutocracy, crony capitalism, shocking levels of inequality, um, continuing right through Obama's presidency, suggests a conscious, confident, powerful ruling class that has largely separated itself from the concerns of the nation's working people. In response, we have individual rights, ethnic and racial hostility, immigrant versus native, moralism and piety over collective economic interests. And I don't think these are necessarily irrational choices. People stake out all sorts of positions for different things, but th it's not helping us um, find a way forward. <clears throat> so I think what I'm trying to do here, and I, I hope you're not expecting an exciting conclusion when I have all the answers, is that maybe by clearing out the wreckage of this historical block we call the New Deal and the New Deal order, that we can maybe begin to think about what Barrington Moore called suppressed historical alternatives. Maybe there's other ideas out there. Maybe there's different models. Or maybe we don't need historical analogies altogether. But maybe uh, by, ne by, by not emphasizing this, we can come up with different, different ways of thinking. My own personal favorite mm -hmm. um, is to think about the Progressive Era as a better metaphor for the future. Uh, that this is a time of, of interclass in, um, solidarities and, and alliances and shifting plans between uh, religious groups, labor groups, middle class reform groups, uh, you know, suffragists for making alliance with uh, women workers and, and, and reform groups for making alliance with trade unions. And, and, but, they w but it wasn't the creation of a political block like it was the New Deal. It was much more kaleidoscopic. It was much more, much more shifting at any given time. Um, more voluntarist which is to say, happening outside the state. I'm not expecting much to happen on the federal level. I'm looking at local level, local creativities, some state level actors, um, but by and large, this is an era, I think, of experimentation, and clearing the intellectual decks is part of that experimentation. 
And I'd like, in conclusion, I'd like to say, I'd like to try to make the case that I don't think this is a jaundiced view of American history. Um, I think that a more thorough understanding of our recent past can provide a more stable intellectual and political foundation on which to build discussions of present and future politics. I hope this argument has not been a recipe for disenchantment, but one for engagement, not an exercise in cynicism, but one that strengthens the imagination. There is, after all, I do believe, more hope to be found in clarity than there is in chasing ghosts. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, we have some time for questions, so Professor Johnson and I will be going around. Raise your hand if you have a question for Professor Cowie. Thanks. Hi, that was an excellent talk. Um, how much of the New Deal era you talk about might have to do with the fact that uh, the United States after the war had obliterated a lot of its economic competition? Yeah, uh, I think it's a great question. Um, it basically would create sort of an autarkic economy in a certain way. Um, so my analogy there is if we look at, say, the Gilded Age, which is a period of tremendous protectionism, actually, workers were still crushed. Um, so I think that, and I, I try to make this point in the book, I do think that it helped to have that economic, uh, to you know, basically be the only player in, in the global economic arena. But that it does not, so that might be a precondition, but that does not necessarily mean that this was going to be a sharing economy. Um, that, that the same old politics could have played itself out. But I do think you're absolutely right. It makes it a lot easier to, um, to create a, a more equitable economy. So yeah, there is a school of thought that says, yeah, this is, you can just reduce this to a certain economic level that, you know, we, we're the only game in town and therefore we're willing to share. I think, I don't even, I don't quite even believe that, right? So I, I think you need these other variables, but right on the money. So just to follow up on that question, I mean, you can look at France or Germany or Sweden, which mm -hmm. competes in the same global market that the United States does, but has made different choices. Right. Why do you think they've made different choices? Why do you think their labor has been more successful in keeping that moment longer than we were? Right. I think no. I think that's a and that becomes an excellent um, uh, counterexample. Right. That. We have, once the global era emerges, and, or free trade and GATT and the rest emerge in, in the 60s and 70s and on through the trade deals of the, of the 80s and the 90s, that um, many of these countries keep a higher union density. And we, you know, we saw what an outlier the United States is in that first graph I, I shared with you. Um, that, in fact, uh, that means that the United States is a little different, I think, in the way these things play themselves out. And uh, Europe has a different relationship with uh, sharing, uh, with distribution, with union density, in the case of Germany, co-determination, in the case of France, various forms of political and social pressure. Uh, that, that's just, uh, I think, culturally, the political culture is, is, is different. Uh, considering uh, the post-World War I bonus march by the veterans, mm -hmm. what was the significance of the GI Bill on the post-World War II economy? Yeah, I think, you know, the GI Bill is a classic, you know, example. Oh, the, so the, the, go ahead. The question was what role the GI Bill had uh, after World War II in the uh, more equal economy. Sure. I mean, I think it's a classic example of, of the expansion and what, what, I, what you know, I, I, I call World War II the third new deal in a way because there, there is all this mobilization uh, by the state uh, during World War II and shortly thereafter. Um, but here, yeah, you have a democratization of education, at least for men, mostly men who served. Uh, it had its racial and uh, gender biases, but as understood at the time, um, it was a widely available uh, higher education for cheap 
paid for by the state. I mean, that, that is democratic, that is, uh, 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 is an opportunity that can be shared by many. Now, whenever I want to horrify my undergraduates, I tell them I went to the University of California of Berkeley as an undergraduate for $700 a semester. Yeah. See? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my sister went through the University of California system for free, and she was outraged they, when they introduced a fifty-dollar fee. Um, so, I mean, it was it was a it was a different period, right? Um, and uh, this was, uh, I, I, I think, that's part and parcel of the entire kind of redistributive system that we saw in the post-war period. Well, I just want to take this a step further um, because, you know. Come along after GI Bill, we have Pell Grants, you know, mm -hmm. very, very important thing here in Rhode Island. And in 1980, we basically switched from financing higher education through grants to financing higher education through loans. Right. And, and this has, you know, basically uh, pushed the responsibility back onto the individual. It's this, this tension between individualism in the United States. We're, and and our collective, mm -hmm. and I think that you know when we when we think about what happened during the Reagan Revolution, we basically saw, you know, it, the the individualism taking control again and really pushing aside our working collectively and and in support of each other. Yeah, and uh, and the message is um, you can incur this debt because you'll get a better job and pay and pay it off later, right? It's very much. Every, every person is his, own, his or her own entrepreneur for their own life, right? And which means y you are basically mortgaging your youth, I think. Um, when I walked out of college, I could do anything I wanted to. Um, I made the mistake of going into academia, but, um, <laughs> uh, but I could have played in a rock and roll band, you know, I, uh, but not if I owe $50,000. I got to go to work for the highest bidder. And I think that has, a, a negative of impact on the culture, on freedom, on entrepreneurship, on a host of things that, uh, that, that we haven't even begun to think about in the way that works. Okay, we have time for one more question, uh, maybe two more questions. We'll start here. There's some students over here. Well, one thing I've heard is that World War II just destroyed huge amounts of capital. Now, in making planes and bombs and guns, they're all gone. I mean, you're, you're just, you know, you're not creating infrastructure, you're not creating education, you're creating junk that blows up. And <laughs> that just destroyed the capital. And that was one of the big leveling movements in the 50s and 40s. Do you agree with that? Um, actually, I think what was more effective was the massive taxation, the redistributive taxation that paid for all that destruction. The 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 war itself was the, the um, spending that actually got us out of, of, of the Depression, right? It was a massive military Keynesian operation, in my interpretation. Um, and um, uh, one of the great questions was, would the workers lose the peace? Um, and if we go back, sorry, this is going to take, this is one of these terrible things. Look at union density. Look at that. That's World War I. So the state mobilized in the war, and then all these promises were made, and then 1919 happened, and all the strikes were broken, and the unions were broken. After the war, right here, there was a little bit of that. We were, they were afraid that was happening, and that the nation would slip back into um, another depression, because all they'd known is war and depression for generations. But the system of redistribution, what they call the, um, the great compression of the war, in which the, the top is brought down through taxation to pay for the war, and the bottom has a floor and has rising wages as it's folded into those uh, military production jobs that uh, the top and the bottom come together and stay together, roughly. I mean, here's um, as union the, the average of union density before, 11.3. Union during 28 and after 12.4, um, you know, it's 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 quite different. So I so I, I wouldn't say I, I would actually say that that that's what s that massive spending is what saved the system rather than destroyed it. 
Hi. Um, Good to see you again. So, uh, given your expertise in the New Deal, I'm, my question is about the Great Recession, and since you call the uh, New Deal kind of this one thing, can only happen one time, um, do you believe the Great Recession did not have the potential to change our unequal system? And would, what would you, potentially, if you were president during the next recession or depression, what would you do? Uh, uh, quit. <laughs> uh, but the, as for the earlier part of your question, um, uh, yeah, so I think that was a good test of my thesis, in fact. The first article on this came out in 2008, and everybody said, no way, man, Obama's going to change everything, you know, like that picture of him as FDR. And um, I said, uh, I don't think so. Um, and I think the good story is that politics was able to restore the status quo ante, which is to say it was able to get back to the way it was before the crash. But I'm not convinced the, el the structural elements after the, after the re Great Recession have changed very much. I mean, it, it was enough to restore the system. But it was not a semi-revolution, I think, of the system in the way the New Deal was. And I don't think the, so don't think the social foundation was there for that revolution. I mean, for instance, Obama had, for what, 10 months he had a supermajority? You know, there's all this crazy thing about whether Al Franken was going to be seated in Minnesota, and then, and then, and then the guy in Massachusetts, you know, died, and you know, there, it was all very tenuous. And then, um, and so, uh, uh, you know, compare with 1932, Roosevelt walks in with a blank check; they'll pass anything. Um, and then Obama loses that brief moment, and then he's sort of back on the ropes for quite a while, except for maybe the health care initiative. Um, so I, I, I don't even think they're even remotely comparable in that, in that way. Um, I would have been in, in favor of a more radical redistributive policy, whether it came from unionization, taxation, um, or, or, or what, whatever the case may be. The, 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 especially the top 1% has a tremendous amount of money. There's, the distance between the top, say, tenth of 1% and the top 5% is unbelievable. Um, so the very, the very, very rich have been getting, and they, there's too much money in, uh, in the top. Um, so it, it becomes top-heavy and unsustainable, and there's not, there's not enough money in the hands of regular people. Now, I don't care how it gets there. I've got no ideological agenda there. I just think it's got to get there somehow. Okay, thank you very much. All right, All right thank you. Thank you all for coming. Just a reminder that next week we have Professors Deanna Trella and Tim 